On behalf of the CHR Canadian HIV Trials Network, je suis heureuse de vous revoir tous ce soir. We are grateful to the CAR organizers and all the former and current CTN postdoctoral fellows who are attending this evening. With those announced today, the CTN will have sponsored 154 awards for 95 individuals. Some people will say that I'm a very prolific mother. <laughs> for the 2019, I'm laughing at my own joke. <laughs> for the 2019-2020 cycle, we received 20 applications and adjudicated nine fellowships this round. Among them, four renewals, four new postdoctoral awards, and one international award. The Postdoc Fellowship Awards Program is an example of collective effort and positive focus. Without the CTN, very generous support from our sponsors, CANFAR, Gilead Sciences Canada, Merck Canada, and Viv Healthcare, we would have not been able to allocate a record number of nine awards. Un grand merci pour votre soutien. Many thanks for your support. Your contributions to the program ensure that HIV research remains healthy and vibrant. The postdoctoral program is a flagship and has been praised by our funders as an important contribution towards future generations. It has proven crucial to provide salary support to protect the time of young upcoming investigators to run their own research projects. Our current postdocs and former postdocs are presenting their work throughout the CAR program. As a quick reminder, we have revised our guidelines to allow candidates with peer-reviewed fellowship salary awards, such as CHR Banting or CHR Postdoctoral Fellows, who also apply to the CTN postdoctoral competition and if selected and rated highly by the CTN Adjudication Committee, they can be considered CTN Fellows. A top-up is offered by CTN for the selected Fellows to attend the CTN meetings and to present the research at this conference. Those selected are required to participate in all standard CTN Fellowship program activities and meet all other related program requirements to maintain their CTN postdoctoral fellow status. The recipients for a second year salary award are Dr. Micheline Mag Magentry, she is the CTN Mark Weinberg Award. Micheline is an MD with infectious disease specialty at the Ottawa General Hospital. She is supervised by Bill Cameron and she will present in a few minutes an update of CTN PT031, the Havarti trial. Dr. Ronita Nat is a CTN James Krebner Award. She is a PhD in health research methodology. Her specialty is in population and public health. She is supervised by former postdoc Troy Grennan at the BC Center for Disease Control, University of British Columbia. She will present an update on her project, which evaluates the drivers of syphilis and other bacterial STIs in gay, bisexual, and other MSM. Kiefer Card, he is a PhD in epidemiology from Simon Fraser University Health Science, Faculty of Safe Health Science. He is supervised by also a former postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Nathan Lachowski from the University of Victoria. Kiefer is presenting shortly as well in community-based intervention to open, optimize PrEP and TASP adherence among sus substance use in gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Hudson Redden, the CTN Merck awardee. Hudson is a PhD from the Department of Health Research Methods Evidence. He is co-supervised by MJ Millo, and Evan Wood from the BC Center for Substance Use, University of British Columbia. His project is investigating the impact of evolving cannabis access on use of HIV acquisition, transmission, and treatment outcomes. The new international fellow goes to Tivani Mashamba Thompson. 
Tivan is a PhD in implementation of HIV-related POC diagnostics for rural and resource-limited settings. She obtained her PhD at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. She'll be co-supervised by Dr. Lehana Tabani from McMaster in Canada and from the University of KwaZulu-Natal by Richard Lessels. Her project is to assess the community-based HIV self-testing peer-to-peer versus health worker and led, worker led delivery modes for improving urban men's engagement in HIV prevention and care in KwaZulu-Natal. The new fellows to receive an award for this cycle, Oralia Gomez Ramirez. Oralia has a PhD in anthropology from UBC she is supervised by Mark Gilbert from the BC Center for Disease Control, School of Population and Public Health at UBC. Her project is examining how contextual factors and health equity considerations shape the implementation of an internet-based testing for sexually transmitted and blood-borne diseases or infections, Pluto. The study will run in Vancouver and five other sites. She will work with sex workers using mixed methods. Peter Scalia, he is a PhD in health services research from the Radboud University in Mengen, Nyingbeng, the Netherlands. Peter's research is in implementation science involving a strategy for HIV prevention and patient-oriented care. He will develop a research project in user testing and implementing the first evidence-based patient decision aid to enable HIV-negative persons who are at risk of HIV acquisition to objectively, objectively assess their risk through a better understanding of various HIV reduction strategies and facilitate decisions that align with their pre preference. Peter will be supervised by Paul McPherson and the University of Ottawa. Shana Skakun Sparlin. Shana has a PhD from the University of Windsor in applied social psychology with a specialty in health psychology. Shana will be supervised by Dr. Trevor Hart from Ryerson University in Toronto. Her project targets a loneliness intervention to improve safer sexual behavior among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. And finally, but not least, Hanisha Mohan. Hanisha has a PhD from the University of Saskatchewan, nonetheless, in integ integrative neuroendocrinology. She will be supervised by Lena Sergidis from the University Health Network, University of Toronto. Hanisha proposes a translational research project, the impact of exposure of dolutegravir during pregnancy risks associated with neural tube defects and impaired metabolism. There is one change listed on the CAR program. Our international fellow, Dr. Ale Mayehu Amberbir, is unable to present because of a mixed up with the Canadian visa. We thank you for your participation and certainly hope that you keep an eye on the CTN website, Twitter, and Facebook. Finally, I would like to acknowledge that and thank once again all our sponsors, the Postdoctoral Adjudication Committee, my colleagues at the CTN, Jess, Sean, Rene, Kristen, and Kristen, for the constant support. May which, merci, Thank you. And thanks to you, Jackie, who really, um, despite your joke, it's actually not a joke, I think. You really have been the mother of this program and, and probably increasingly the grandmother, given the fact that many of the postdoctoral fellows that are circling through these great pictures and reminding us of how much we've aged, um, have come themselves to supervise postdoctoral fellows. Uh, and so congratulations to all of those of you who have received your renewals. 
uh, and all of those of you who are joining this great group uh, of postdoctoral fellows, um, I think the, the tremendous thing about this program is how many people are retained within the field of HIV research in Canada and, and internationally. I think we have an exceptional rate of retention, and now, uh, and myself included, I was a postdoctoral fellow, and I'm now, uh, if you don't know who I am, I hope you do, it's Marina Klein, I'm from McGill University, and I'm one of the national co-directors of the Canadian HIV Trials Network. So uh, that hopefully will inspire you to continue to do the good work that you're gonna do, and we're gonna get to hear about today, and continue to uh, contribute productively to the HIV response in this country. So without further ado, I'm gonna present our first speaker today, uh, and this is Dr. Ronita Nath, who will be, uh, as the recipient of the James Krepner Postdoctoral Fellowship Award, something that's dear to my heart because I knew James very well and who uh, participated with us on some hepatitis C work uh, when he was alive. Um, and it's entitled Assessing the Drivers of Syphilis and Other Bacterial Sexually Transmitted Infections in Gay, Bisexual, and Other Men Who Have Sex with Men, a Mixed Method Study. Welcome, Ronita. Okay, hello everyone, uh, my name is Renita. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure to be here. So today I'll be talking about my project, which is about assessing the drivers of syphilis and other bacterial sexually transmitted infections in gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Uh, my supervisor is Dr. Troy Grennan, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So the objectives of today's presentation is to provide an overview and progress of the study to present the early findings and to dis discuss challenges and next steps forward. So some background, um, as many of you may know, after years of decline, the rates of syphilis and other bacterial STIs have risen in many parts of the world, particularly among men who have sex with men, or MSM. Uh, this epidemic is of particular concern for those living with HIV, uh, since bacterial STIs may lead to more serious complications in this population. Bacterial STIs and MSM are also key drivers of HIV transmission and are associated with increased risk for HIV acquisition. So in British Columbia, uh, syphilis is at uh, record high rates. The BC rate is in blue and the nationwide rate is in orange. So you can see there was a dip in provincial cases in 2017, but what isn't shown here is that the rate in the number in 2018, 2018 was actually the highest number of syphilis cases since the epidemic started. So in 2018, the number of cases was 925 uh, cases of infectious syphilis diagnosed in BC. Looking at this table here, you can see that MSM continue to comprise the greatest number of infectious syphilis cases in BC. About 70% 70 of the cases were among MSM, but this number was probably much higher because uh, we switched to a new data collection system last year, uh, which also led to the high number of unknowns in 2018 compared to 2017. So efforts to address the rise in bacterial STIs have focused on expanded screening, increased partner notification, and on increasing condom use. But despite these efforts, the rates of STIs continue to rise. So the primary objective of our project was to examine the knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs of MSM around sexual behaviors to better understand the drivers of bacterial STIs. And we also wanted to look at the acceptability of STI prevention approaches. So our design was a mixed methods design. We collected qualitative narratives initially with a small sample of participants. One of the deliverables of the qualitative study was a cross-sectional survey that would be implemented subsequently with a larger sample of participants. So the qualitative study procedures consisted of one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews with 25 participants. We recruited participants from the BC CDC clinics and through the online sexual networking apps, Scruff and Squirt, to be eligible to participate, participants must have identified as male, been at least 18, identified as gay, bisexual, or other MSM. Uh, they must have been fluent in English and sexually active in the past six months. 
In the interviews, we asked about knowledge, uh, attitudes, and beliefs around STIs, perceptions of STI risks, experiences with healthcare providers, measures taken to prevent STIs, the role of substance use in sexual activity and decision making, the acceptability of pre exposure prophylaxis for syphilis and other STIs, and the role of social networks. So, to date, uh, we have finished the qualitative interviews and the majority of the qualitative analysis, particularly around syphilis. We have submitted a paper of our qualitative findings on syphilis, and we're working on another qualitative manuscript at the moment. Uh, we've developed the cross-sectional survey based on findings from the qualitative study, and this will be administered as part of the 2019 SexNow online survey. So today I really want to share with you the findings from the qualitative study. These were the characteristics of our participants from the qualitative study. As you can see, the majority were white and identified as gay. Eight participants were living with HIV. Nine had a syphilis diagnosis in the past year, and 13 had a gonorrhea or chlamydia diagnosis. I also want to point out that none of the participants were on HIV prep at the time of data collection. So now I'll just go through uh, the major themes that emerged from the analyses. So first, most participants were aware of the recent surge in syphilis rates in the province, and they knew that the epidemic was disproportionately impacting MSM. Some men talked about the apparent inevitability of syphilis if one was a sexually active gay man. As one participant told us, once you're gay, it's like everyone has syphilis. However, uh, several participants said that the syphilis epidemic was really not being discussed among their gay friends and sexual partners. One participant said that he didn't get the sense that anyone was overly concerned about the syphilis epidemic. Uh, the majority of participants explained that the rising rates in syphilis had not impacted their sexual behaviors or the, the way they met with prospective partners. Oops, sorry. Okay, second, we did find heterogeneity in syphilis-related health literacy. Those with a prior diagnosis of syphilis or living with HIV were more likely to report being knowledgeable about syphilis than HIV-negative men without a prior history of syphilis, although this knowledge was not always correct. Uh, among HIV-negative men who had never had syphilis, many admitted not knowing much about the infection or being confused between the various STIs. As one participant said, I get mixed up between syphilis and chlamydia and gonorrhea. I don't remember the differences between those, but I know syphilis is on the rise. Another participant believed that you pretty much took the same meds to get rid of syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. Uh, third, we found that unsurprisingly, people did not want to get infected with syphilis. Men were concerned about getting syphilis. However, many acknowledged that changing their sexual behaviors was difficult because sexual pleasure was also very important to them. Uh, most men shared that the need to engage in pleasurable sex outweighed concerns they had about syphilis during a particular sexual encounter. For instance, uh, a 57-year-old participant living with HIV and no prior diagnosis of syphilis shared like I said, I have some concern about syphilis, but if I'm looking to have sex with someone, it's not something that I'm thinking about at that moment. Okay, so the fourth theme, this idea that HIV was exceptional compared to the other STIs also emerged in the analysis, that HIV was the big one to worry about because it couldn't be cured. Um, as one HIV negative participant shared, HIV would be the only one I would not want to get for obvious reasons. Now, even among those living with HIV, some participants uh, shared that they just were not as concerned about syphilis because they felt it was almost insignificant to the HIV they were living with. Um, as one person said, well, what's the worst that's going to happen to me? Nothing really. So what's the big deal? I'm already sick. And then kind of related to that theme was this theme, um, that an undetectable HIV status was equal to HIV and therefore equal to some, some sort of risk. So many men believed that being undetectable meant being at low or lower risk of transmitting HIV rather than no risk of transmission. One HIV negative participant shared, it's like 99.9% .9 they're not transmitting the virus. Some participants said that they were just not clear on the scientific evidence for undetectability. Uh, as one participant said, I don't know what undetectable means. So meaning they had HIV, but it's not undetectable in the last testing, right? That, I understand, is not 100% good. It's not something we can be 100% sure of. 
Now, those who said that they believed undetectability meant a low risk of transmitting HIV were either not inclined to have condomless anal sex with partners with an undetectable HIV status, or they shared not wanting to have uh, sex with them at all. And then the last theme, uh, where we discussed the acceptability of syphilis prep with participants. Uh, most said they would be interested. However, again, many HIV-negative participants without a prior history of syphilis cited several potential barriers to accessing syphilis prep, including antibiotic resistance, cost, and unknown side effects. This idea of sex-related stigma also emerged when discussing syphilis prep. Some participants uh, believed that syphilis prep would only be meant for those who were very sexually active, and they personally felt that they did not fall in that category. Okay, so conclusions uh, from the, the qualitative findings. Um, men's accounts depicted that they organized their safer sexual strategies around HIV, not syphilis, even though most were aware of the resurgence in syphilis and that they could be impacted by it. Uh, there does seem to be a disjuncture between the concerns of public health actors and MSM. While public health officials are becoming increasingly alarmed about the syphilis epidemic, MSM seem to be moderately concerned for several reasons. Uh, including anxiety about HIV, a lack of self-efficacy or belief that they can overcome the epidemic, and the belief that syphilis may not be that serious because it can be treated. And because syphilis is only moderately concerning and also balanced against the benefits of sexual pleasure, syphilis prevention is not being prioritized. Uh, syphilis prep may possibly be a strategy that could empower individuals to prevent syphilis and give them the agency to know that they're doing something to uh, prevent the infection. So challenges, um, in the qualitative study, assessing uh, health literacy was certainly challenging uh, because in the, in the context of a qualitative study, it's hard to do because uh, participants provided vague responses on the extent of their knowledge. So to more robustly look at this, we've included some very specific health literacy questions to include in the cross-sectional survey. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, we are waiting for the Sex Now online survey to be launched, after which we will get that quantitative data analyze it and compare it to our qualitative findings, and in the meantime, we will continue analyzing and writing up our qualitative data. And I'd like to acknowledge CTN and that this study is being funded by the Vancouver Foundation and the BCCDC Foundation for Public Health. I'm happy to take any questions. I am good with that. Okay. Yes. It's surprising. Were you surprised by the lack of knowledge and education in the patients that you did? You do the the. I did. I was one of the interviewers, and then we had two community-based interviewers. Was I surprised? I found that overall there was a lot more knowledge than I expected. Uh, so, I guess among we did see a lot of knowledge first of all. So there was heterogeneity. There wasn't a lack of knowledge. It was, the lack of knowledge was among HIV negative participants without a prior history of syphilis. But those who had been diagnosed with syphilis, they knew a lot. And so um, I, I was surprised by how much knowledge some people did have. And, yeah. and what about uh, the role of condoms in the prevention of transmission? Was that a fact that was clear or not? Yeah, so people definitely, con we, we had themes in the quality of analysis like condoms are a buzzkill and overall like people weren't using condoms except in terms of, um, you know, if they were an HIV negative partner was sleeping with someone who was living with HIV. So in that situation, yes, but in any other situation, they're like, no, I, we're not going to use condoms. And so the literature kind of supports that um, and, and so that makes sense of why advocating for increased condom use hasn't really been working. And my last question is, Is did you explore their um, understanding of transmission through oral sex? Yes, definitely. We asked, well, we asked very broad questions. We didn't want to um, guide participants because we use grounded theory. So we kept it quite open We uh, in how they believed it was transmitted. Um, only a, a few people did understand that it, you know, it could be transmitted through Oral, oral sex, and this is among the HIV negative participants. Um, but those who are living with HIV or prior diagnosis, diagnosis of syphilis, they knew it could be transmitted in in multitude of ways. Yeah. Ten. Okay. 
Thank you very much. That's a great way to start, so <laughs> we'll move on to the second presentation, which will be given by Mickey McGinty, uh, viremia and T-cell kinetics in the Harvardi clinical trial. And this will be an update, because we've heard from you before. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks to, the C to CAR and to the CTN for inviting us to give these talks today. It's a really great opportunity to share the results um, of our trial in particular. So CTNPT031, or Havarti, is a, a clinical trial that we've undertaken in Ottawa. Um, I'm being supervised there by Dr. Bill Cameron in execution, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about the trial, but mostly I'm going to try and dive into the results that we've accumulated so far in terms of our primary and secondary outcomes. I have nothing to disclose. So Havarti is a pilot trial. It's an um, uncontrolled clinical trial using betalizumab, which is an anti-alpha-4, beta-7, integrin monoclonal antibody in HIV-positive ART-treated adults across the treatment interruption. We were uh, hoping to find a sustained plasma viral load suppression uh, in our participants following treatment interruption and treatment with betalizumab. And then we wanted to assess the uh, plasma viral load and immune kinetics in these participants following uh, vedalizumab introduction and treatment interruption. It was a dose finding study, so uh, the, of the 12 planned participants, eight of them have been enrolled and have completed the study protocol, and they were enrolled sequentially into groups of four at the different dosing arms. And the first uh, group got the highest dose at 300 milligrams, and the second group got a lower dose at 150 milligrams at each infusion visit. The protocol was for seven infusions, um, which straddled an analytical treatment interruption right in the middle, and they were front-loaded to uh, maximize uh, the uh, saturation early in the course. The primary outcomes were the safety and tolerability of a fixed-term betalizumab treatment in this population, which, uh, in which it had not been studied at the time of the study at uh, uh, our trial outset, and to look for incidents of lasting uh, viral load suppression after vedalizumab and treatment interruption. We also wanted to address the kinetics and the trajectory of viral loads and CD4 T, T cells before, during, and after a treatment interruption on vedalizumab, and uh, look for any, uh, and observe that any recurrent or sustained plasma viral load rebound after the treatment interruption would be resuppressible with uh, a resumption of antiretroviral therapy. And we did some additional investigations on the pharmacokinetic measures of vedalizumab itself, as well as um, we were able to obtain biopsy tissue from the rectal mucosa of our participants to uh, specifically look at how uh, the impact of velizumab had on gut uh, immune and HIV kinetics. So uh, as a baseline, our, our two groups in the study were generally quite similar. They were all men. They were uh, about 40 years old. They had mostly been on antiretroviral therapy for about five or six years. They had high um, pre-treatment uh, high pretreatment nadirs in general, and, and that was um, part of the inclusion criteria of the study. And they had high CD4 cell counts at baseline. During the course of their treatment interruptions, which were quite long, so the, the duration of treatment interruption in the high-dose group uh, was on average 35 weeks and ranged from 30 to 42 weeks. And in group two was about 33 weeks. But their mean uh, CD4 counts during the treatment interruption remained quite stable, and I'll show a little bit more about that later on. So in terms of safety, we did have one episode of an upper respiratory tract influenza infection that required a visit to the emergency department during the uh, interventional phase of the study, uh, and one episode of a grade three hepatitis, which occurred after completion of the intervention phase of the study and which resolved um, within one week without specific action. And there were no other significant adverse events, and side effects were very rarely reported by any participant in either arm of the study in terms of during or after infusion visits. The main outcome that we looked at was the plasma viral load uh, uh, after the analytical treatment interruption. And as you can see from the graph, we did not see sustained viral suppression in our participants in this clinical trial. What we did see, though, was a, a change in um, viral load set point in our participants uh, as compared to their pretreatment viral set points. So the pretreatment viral set points are set off uh, on the left side of the graph. 
And in the high-dose treatment group, group one, which, received, which is the pink line on the graph, they had a peak viral rebound that was about 1.2 logs below their pretreatment set point, and they stayed about a log below their pretreatment set point until um, week 32 of the study, which was about three half-lives after the last infusion of vedolizumab that they had received, after which point we observed that every participant began to have a trend to rising viral load. In group two, the rebound was not blunted. Um, they rebounded to a level that was about 0.2 logs above their pretreatment viral set point, but then they also fell to a, a level that settled at about a log below their pretreatment viral load. But uh, the duration of that effect was shorter. It only lasted until one half-life beyond the, the last infusion of the drug, at which point every participant's viral load began to rise. So this is uh, pretty significantly different from what we would have expected to see from uh, the course of a treatment interruption where there was no therapeutic effect of the interventional material. So inset in the, in the corner of this slide is a graph of um, participants from the placebo arm of an HIV vaccine trial done at our center some years ago, which shows what's more of a typical trajectory during treatment interruption, which is that you have fairly rapid viral rebound that reaches a level at or above the pretreatment uh, viral set point and then stays there. So um, the, the difference in viral load set point during the treatment phase of our study was an interesting finding for us, although it, di it didn't reach sustained viral suppression for our participants. We also looked at the kinetics a little bit, so we assessed the viral doubling time between the two groups, and there, again, these were different between group one and group two. In group one, the viral doubling time was calculated out to be 7.6 days compared to group two, which had a more uh, natural um, viral doubling time after a treatment interruption of about 2.6 days. The group from the insight graph that I showed you before had a calculated viral doubling time in the same interval of 3.4 days, and two to three days is generally what would have been expected from a natural or clinical treatment interruption as seen in the past in the literature. In terms of CD4 and CD8 T cell kinetics, we um, saw a modest decline in CD4 T cell counts after treatment interruption, but these were, were fairly sustained throughout the duration of the, the quite long treatment interruption in our participants. And we saw the expected CD4 CD8 reversal with the emergence of the virus um, in rebound. Although, again, in group one and group two, we saw a difference in that in group two, or sorry, group one had an attenuated CD8 rise. Uh, as compared to group one. So their uh, CD4, CD8 ratio um, did not uh, reverse quite to the same degree as uh, the participants from group two. So for our, 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 our more primary outcomes, the vedolizumab was safe and well tolerated, and it appears to have a biologic effect on the viral rebound and T cell kinetics, which is both uh, dose and duration related. We have, as I said, mentioned we had the opportunity to get uh, gut biopsies from each of our participants at three time points during the study, and I'm going to show you, share with you some of that data now, which is um, we haven't shared before, so it's pretty exciting. So here we're looking just at CD4 and CD8 T cells within the gut um, mucosa from our participants, and um, from baseline to week 24, at which point all of the participants were on a treatment interruption and were, uh, had, uh, still had a therapeutic level of vedolizumab, presumably, you see a, a dramatic fall in the CD4 count as expected with persistent viral, uh, virus in the blood at that point, and the CD8 count uh, um, rises as well as expected. The highlighted participants are the ones who didn't trigger restart of antiretroviral therapy until after the final biopsy at week 48 was taken. And this subset of patients did have a relatively protected CD4 T cell subset within the gut at the week 24 mark, which was just an interesting observation. We looked to see if the, what alpha-4, beta-7 expression did during the course of the trial, and as expected, without any alpha-4, beta-7 block, um, uh, anti-alpha-4, beta-7 antibody at the beginning, you see a variable level of alpha-4, beta-7 expression, which falls uh, at week 24, at which point they're all on the drug and then it, it rises again at week 48 when they've all been off vilizumab for more than 28 weeks. It, uh, we looked at cell type distribution in the rectal mucosa before, during, and after the vilizumab therapy. Other than the CD4 and the CD8 cell counts, which I just showed you separately, the other cell type distribution was quite similar. Uh, and the alpha-4, beta-7 expression was the same for all of the cell subtypes that we looked at. It was uh, hard to find during the week 24, and afterward it had uh, risen again. We looked at CCR5 and CCR6 expression in the uh, rectal mucosal T cell subset as well. Uh, we didn't see any significant differences at any time point during the study. Um, we did see some interesting trends with cytokine expression 
in that uh, cells that doubly expressed interferon gamma and TNF-alpha were reduced throughout the course of the study um, regardless of, uh, you know, despite the fact that the velizumab was gone and ART was uh, uh, restarted on the majority of the participants by the week 48 mark, we saw that this was still present at week 48. And uh, along with that, this, the population of cells that was not expressing either of these was, had risen steadily during the course of the study in all participants across the groups. This was true in uh, CD4, CD8, as well as the mucosally associated invariant T cells, but not true of the gamma delta T cells or the NK cells where the expression of these uh, cytokines was the same across all time points. We uh, had some colleagues from, our colleagues from Montreal were able to do some uh, assessment of the DNA viral load and the RNA uh, viral load for the gut mucosal samples as well. And unsurprisingly, in uh, our population of patients who were all viremic at week 24, we saw that the uh, RNA expression was uh, higher at week 24 than it had been at baseline when they were all virally suppressed. And similarly, the DNA had risen after uh, treatment. Without um, a, a pre and post treatment interruption level, it's a little bit hard to interpret what effect velizumab might have had on this dynamic. So in summary, velizumab uh, binding to alpha-4, beta-7 on the mucosal T cells was demonstrated up to week 24 of the study and was reversed by week 48. And the mucosal CD4, CD8 T cell ratios were preserved in a subset of the participants who had lower sustained plasma viral load during the treatment interruption. And the decreased levels of T cells co-expressing interferon gamma and TNF alpha and increased levels of cells expressing neither were observed across the study period. And I uh, want to thank a, a lot of people who did a lot of work uh, on this study. It's a big clinical trial, so it's not just me, Dr. Cameron in particular, who's uh, supervising me, and Dr. Angel, who's provided a lot of support, including from his lab, and Dr. Stephanie, or sorry, Stephanie Ber uh, Berkshenkel in particular, who did a lot of that uh, flow data analysis for us and our colleagues in uh, Montreal, Nicola and Julia, who put together that DNA work and, and those slides that I showed. And that's it. Thanks, guys. Question waiting for other people to ask questions. Um, I think when you presented this earlier this week, you mentioned that a next step uh, that you're thinking of doing would be to uh, try a higher dose of the, the, the antibody, given that there seems to be a dose response. Do you, do you think, I, I mean, the implication, I think, of what you're saying is that it has to do with the half-life of the antibody. So basically, as long as the antibody is present in the system, you're getting some antiviral effect, uh, and that this will wane with, with as, the, as it's removed. Um, do you have any measures of the levels of of this other than the inhibition of, uh, that, that you could make those correlations and can you extrapolate about how much or how, what the interval you need or how much anti, uh, dose you might need to have a more prolonged impact? Yeah, that's a, a to be continued. Um, we, we have been in the process of trying to get the, the drug level as well as the presence of anti-drug antibody levels measured and we have sample for that. It just hasn't been done yet. So yes, we're hoping to be able to look more specifically at the dose-response relationship. Um, the reason we think more will be better is because we saw a dose-response relationship even at this dose, and 300 milligrams per infusion is about four milligrams per kilogram in our average patient who's a fit, young um, man. Whereas the trial that this uh, was inspired by, the, the animal study published in Nature by Dr. Bayer already used using a macaque model, they used doses there of 50 milligrams per kilogram. It's a considerable gap between the licensed human dose for velizumab and that experimental dose in the trial. There, it's also, it, and you hit on the other point, which is the appearance of the effect here is antiviral, and the mechanism through which that activity is happening is still pretty unclear. But it's also possible that the antibody might have a hermetic effect. It might have an antiviral effect, even at a low dose, and have a more immune potentiating effect that induces a long-term suppression at a higher dose, like what was seen in the animal model. Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding the immune activation, the level of immune activation. Did you check, for example, for, for that during the, the period of a peak to see whether the decrease of a lower level is associated to lower immune activation? 
So we haven't done that yet, although uh, we are going to explore what we could look at to try and tease that out from the, the gut sample that we have left. Again, we, when we designed the pilot trial, we were looking for a categorical effect, so we, haven't, we hadn't really timed the biopsy samples to give us a, a great, to be able to answer those questions in great detail. It would have been more effective, I think, to have a biopsy done before and after the treatment interruption to see those things. Um, but we, we do still have a lot of tissue, and if, if you wanted to uh, suggest what might be best to look at in terms of immune activation. And in the blood? Because in human in general, we're correcting the evolution with the blood activation. Yeah, we haven't done any of the additional uh, immune uh, uh, studies or the flow on the peripheral cells, but that is going to be done. And we just haven't uh, settled on exactly what we're going to look at yet. Thank you. Very nice. Gone. Yeah, sorry, the mic was not working. Um, very nice presentation. Um, what was the goal to look at the cytokine? Can you make any correlation with the, uh, the TNF alpha interferon gamma that you saw with the increase of T cells? So, so far I'm actually, I've, the, the result is a bit counter, it's a bit, sorry, it's, it's, it makes sense in terms of the active HIV act infection that the patients were having during the, the majority of the study period. That phenotype has is, is, uh, been uh, identified, the sort of double positive interferon gamma and um, uh, uh, TNF-alpha, the, the, the co-expression of those things when absent uh, confers a, a, a phenotype that's more consistent with immune activation and is more consistent with active viral replication. So it, it's not really that surprising that we saw that phenotype. The delay that we see in any return to baseline in those cytokine measures is probably a reflection of how long it takes the gut to recover after um, uh, active viral replication and infection. But we should explore that a little bit further. It was, uh, it was a, an exploratory analysis that was done. It wasn't something we set out to look at. We, but we, we do have, um, a, like I said, additional sample that we can, can try and see if there are other correlates that might help us understand what that um, outcome actually means. But it was not the, the intention uh, when we designed the study to look at that in particular. Thanks, Mickey. That was great. Um, now we're going to shift gears again uh, back to um, uh, sexual behaviors. Uh, PrEP, party and play, and the role of pre-exposure prophylaxis in ending HIV transmission among gay and bisexual men who enjoy chemsex, which will be given by Dr. Kiffer Card. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Kiffer. As was said, so that's out of the way. And um, I wanted to start today with just a brief, brief question, because I know it's kind of like late in the day and we're all expecting dinner to start soon, so I wanted to like call our attention to dinner, because I think pre-thinking through will just make dinner all that better, because you'll be nice and hungry and that sort of thing. So for those of you who drink uh, wine, I want you to raise your hand if, if given a steak, who would choose white wine over red wine to eat with that steak. Raise your hand. Uh, so choose, if, if you choose white, yeah, with steak. Okay, a couple weirdos. And who would choose red instead of white? The vast majority of you. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I wanted to call Jackie's attention to that because at our CTN dinner, when asked what kind of wine I wanted, I said, well, it depends what we're eating. And, uh, and she said, well, we have quite a prima donna here. And, uh, and so I took a, not, not a grain of offense at that, but, uh, but uh, definitely I think it does depend because these patterns of the way things go together, I think is a really fascinating thing to think about. And this is particularly true when it comes to substance use. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say I have no conflicts of interest and whatnot, but anyhow, so, uh, so this is particularly important when we think about patterns of substance use, because it doesn't mean the same thing 
to drink white wine with steak as it does to drink red wine with steak. In fact, you can actually think about gradations of like maybe I would drink a lighter steak with a leaner, or a lighter wine with a leaner steak, even within the red wine category. And this is true of substance use as well. And so some of my previous work before beginning my fellowship was looking at those patterns of substance use and what sort of cultural and social factors were associated with those. And so in that work, I found that people who engaged in things like what we consider sex drug use or that sort of thing, um, those who engaged in maybe polysubstance use, I don't know why it went back, um, tend to exhibit some, what we classically think of as risky behavior. Uh, the higher odds of serodiscordant condylless anal sex, greater HIV seropositivity, and this sort of thing. But it's important that in the era of treatment as prevention and the, in the era of PrEP, that these factors need not necessarily be associated with risk. Indeed, through treatment as prevention or antiretroviral therapy and through pre-exposure pre prophylaxis, events that were once considered risky can now uh, be perfectly fine events with very low risk, if any, uh, of transmission. And so I wanted to see within these kind of patterns of substance use that I'd been studying, um, what, what of those patterns are associated with differential uptake and awareness and interest in things like antiretroviral therapy and PrEP. And this came out of some work that we did looking at awareness of treatment as prevention uptake in British Columbia with the Momentum Health Study, where I found that diffusion tended to be not as good among certain sectors of the community, particularly those from marginalized communities and that sort of thing as well. And so that's what we did in this study is kind of this first step towards understanding what sort of interventions we need, um, community-based acceptable interventions to ensure that people have the capability of adhering uh, to pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so to that end, we uh, leveraged data for this analysis from the 2014-15 sex noun survey. The 2018 survey was just completed in person. Uh, this is a zero cross-sectional survey that's been going on for years now, periodically, um, every year or every couple years. And uh, it's predominantly of sexual and gender minority men. Um, participants are recruited for this survey mostly online or through uh, community partners and advertising online, and it was an online survey. Now we do both in-person and online surveying. And so um, we asked them, you know, kind of a good set of questions. These were developed in kind of a community-based fashion for gay men and by gay and bisexual men. And, um, and these looked at issues like sexual health and mental health and social well-being and healthcare access. And so using that data, particularly looking at the patterns, the way things went together, like the steak and the wine, we looked at how patterns of substance use kind of co-occurred in that population. And uh, my screen's really washed out, so it's hard to tell what's going on, but ultimately is what latent class analysis is, is you take a set of measured characteristics and you say, looking in that variation, all the noise and the ways people respond, what are the general patterns that we could identify and assess from it? And so then we can impose those patterns onto the population to allow, instead of coming up with just the categories that we think exist, we can identify the categories that actually exist in the data. And I consider this a bit about our work about letting quantitative data speak for itself, so to say. And so the substance use classes that we identified really matched a lot of the things that I had found in my previous work, largely because we measured the same uh, variables and we chose the same criteria in select selecting our model. And this is actually a really important thing for latent class analyses. If you ever get asked to review, you have to pay attention to the fact that it seems like everybody, every time somebody does a latent class analysis, they come up with these different patterns and it's never quite the same. And so this replication of previous or very similar results, I think is really an important finding in and of itself. And so what were those patterns? We identified limited drug use, because this is important that we, we often tend to think of, oh, you know, what do we mean when we say a person who uses drugs? We have to recognize that things like socially acceptable drugs like alcohol and tobacco and marijuana are involved in that too. And that a lot of this just comes down to preferences and choices around coping and choices around, around life. And so um, that limited drug use class, as you would kind of expect, was uh, definitely the highest. It was characterized by infrequent use of most drugs, including alcohol. Uh, tobacco and marijuana, which we can kind of get a sense of as the more socially acceptable drugs. And this was very similar to the conventional drug use class, which again was about 30% of the population associated with 
again, so more socially acceptable drugs, but also some inclusion of poppers, which tend to have a little bit more social acceptability and are indeed one of the more frequently reported drugs used. Uh, then we identified a class of club drug users. These people used uh, alcohol consumption, you know, at least a, a few times a week, um, marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, and uh, off-prescription stimulants. And that was about 5% of our sample. And then this sex drug use class, which is again about 5% of the sample, they reported things like poppers, erectile drugs, ecstasy, GHB, crystal meth, and ketamine. So kind of, kind of the phenomena that in Europe they call chemsex here, party and play, and, and in different sub-communities they might call them, call them different things. And then a, a sample of about 11% which reported prescription drug use. Uh, and uh, this was things like pain medication and sleeping medication, anxiety medication, um, erectile drugs and stimulants. And then finally, this very small class of these people who basically used uh, most of the drugs that reported are at least higher frequency. And so they did have the highest probability of using every drug uh, in the model. And, um, and then we looked at this in relation to these patterns of awareness in relation to knowledge about art, knowledge about PEP, and knowledge about PrEP. And then uh, this sample that I'm presenting today is just among HIV negative and unknown, unknown men, and then uh, interest in PrEP as well. And so you, you can kind of maybe call attention to that this is like 1415, and so like places like BC didn't quite have um, a, a, a PrEP program up and running. So that's why that's our me measure here. As we go into 2018-19 data, we can then look at patterns of sexualized drug use in relation to actual uptake, so that's kind of exciting. And so what did we find? Well, compared to the limited drug use class, so that's the referent group here for each of these drugs, we see that the conventional group is more likely to, to know what ART is, know what PEP is, know about PrEP, and have an interest in taking PrEP. The club drug use, similar trends, we see greater interest and uh, knowledge about PrEP. The sex drug use class, if you look at the effect size there, you know, it's basically double of what we see in the club drug, double or more what we see in the conventional Drug, but again, every kind of measure of awareness about art and treatment was higher in the sex drug use class. In the prescription drug use class, again, indicating relative to those in the limited use class, a greater awareness of, of PEP and PrEP and interest in actually taking PrEP. And then finally, for the assorted drug use, again, a highly elevated uh, odds of 2.3 of being know knowing about PrEP and 3.07 for being interested in PrEP. And so I think this really starts to paint a picture that runs counterintuitive to what we often think about people who use drugs, right? We often think about people who use drugs as maybe not having all of the self-efficacy, all of the experience, all of that sort of thing necessary to protect themselves. And I think these data speak directly in contrast to that. That is actually what we see is that those people who engage in what we would sometimes define as risky substance use, these people are actually very aware and very knowledgeable about how to manage and protect their own health. And so I think this highlights why for community-based work, we need to be aware of the natural and inborn expertise of communities and not just rely on our academic training and that sort of thing to kind of speak to and understand uh, what's going on in their lives. I also think this highlights the um, fact that PrEP is highly socially acceptable in these communities. And so when we think of programs like that combine and take PrEP and, and use it to encourage and leverage people who use drugs as not only being the early adopters that can help with the diffusion of this sort of thing, but also in maintaining and helping them to support their own health, I think is a really vital um, aspect of our work in public health and community-based work is, is letting that happen and making sure that 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 is available. And I think this is really important because even in our 2018 survey, if you restrict down, and I just did this quick analysis to look just among people who inject drugs as a particular subclass of, of people who use drugs, you can see that the uptake of many harm reduction services, including pre-exposure prophylaxis as a harm reduction measure, um, aren't quite what I say that they should be. I would like to see higher numbers in all these categories. So I think this highlights for me the great work ahead of us in being able to take intervention and finding what are the things that are going to work for people and, and what is going to be the acceptability of those things. And I think our data uh, from this analysis really seem to me to say that people do expect it, but it's about that structural 
and social situation in which they're embedded. And we have to be aware and conscious of that uh, to ensure that we um, have the programs and policies in place to make sure that the numbers don't continue to look like this for the next 10 years. And I think about this in the context of things like pre-exposure prophylaxis and accessing it, and making sure that the way our services are delivered are not so complicated or not so rigorous that people who have lots of stuff going on in their lives can't access it. And so looking at low threshold solutions, whether that be pre-exposure prophylaxis, like it is shown here in BC, this is kind of the diagram of what happens both from a provider and patient viewpoint, uh, but also in all the many issues around safe supply, the issues around needle exchange, making sure that those are low threshold enough to ensure that people can access the treatments they need. And so finally, I just want to talk a bit about next steps. Going from here, looking at these patterns of drug use, next we'll look and see within those patterns what of those will actually drive adherence uh, ability and that sort of thing. So looking at things how homophobia or access to care, how that would impact within a specific class. Because it was kind of anti, you know, it was kind of against my theory. I, I originally thought to find that some of these people using drugs would not be able to access and not be interested or not be aware because that was similar to some previous research I did. And so, so this uh, being a bit surprising is we'll, we're going to dive deeper into this data and look and say, you know, within people who use sex drugs, what are the things that really make a difference in being a facilitator or a barrier to that care? And so that work and the work that has been to, done today is not possible without the wonderful support of all the participants, not only in the 1415 surveys I've used here, but also in future iterations in the 18, 2018 and 2019 surveys. The expertise and wonder, wonderful community-based work of people at the Community-Based Research Center in Vancouver. And then of course, the people who support researchers like me and communities like ours. Um, to, to do the work and to be able to take time and look at these things uh, that I think otherwise wouldn't get a lot of attention uh, in today's healthcare system. So thanks. Thank you, that, that was great. And uh, congratulations on a very thoughtful analysis. Um, I'm wondering about, so really interesting to see what that association was and I'm, I'm wondering what things you could do to test your hypothesis. Um, did you take a look to see whether the men who were using uh, drugs for the purposes of sex were uh, engaging in uh, other things that would show kind of a protective activity to look after their health? And I'm thinking about, it's a little bit soon maybe for the programs for getting HPV vaccine. The, the free programs hadn't been introduced quite yet. Um, but maybe just STBBI testing, uh, were they more likely to get a test? Other yeah, things? so, uh, you know, you're, that's kind of on the spot. I'm not 100% sure. We did run and look at things like other access measures. Mm -hmm. And I remember being not thoroughly impressed, and so that's why they're not included here, is, uh, is there wasn't a whole lot. But I can speak to maybe that a bit of this is around the homegrown nature, because I think a lot, of, a lot of PrEP, as we see in BC and other places, is really homegrown. The demand for it isn't necessarily coming from doctors to patients, but from patients asking their doctors for access. And so I think about, in so many instances of various studies and various aspects of gained bisexual men's behavior, I've often seen that the community-driven approaches are the ones that seem to, A, work really well, but also tend to be the ones that are quite common. And so I can think of, like, other, like seroadaptive behaviors and the way gay and bisexual men use those. So that's like sero sorting. So, you know, who you select as a partner based on their sero status or strategic positioning, you know, whether you're top or bottom based on your sero status or your partner status. Like these sort of things are quite like I consider homegrown activities as well. And in similar work using latent class analysis and also looking at like partner number in relation to that is what we see is again, the people who we tend to think of as really risky, people with lots of sexual partners or something like that, those are the people that seem to be the most expert at deploying the strategies to protect their health. And so um, I, think, I think it's good to look at the behaviors in that way because uh, guys have a certain bit of control around certain behaviors, but something like healthcare access isn't always my choice of whether or not, you know, I have access to a clinic or have the time in my schedule or can get time off work to meet whatever time demands the clinic might be open for. And, uh, and so, uh, so maybe that's a bit why uh, something like HIV testing, what is quite is significant. And I think it's also that we think about that, like, the generally high prevalence of, of, of communities promoting testing and that sort of thing 
also the way that we take testing into places like bathhouses and other community venues to make that connection. And I think that community-based and delivered care uh, could explain a bit of that. Whereas this being in 2014-15, the biomedical paradigm at the time, I mean, my sense of it is that it was still kind of a biomedical paradigm and not a community paradigm. And that started to shift, you know, in 2014-15, I think around this period, particularly with regards to advocacy for PrEP, uh, in the wake and preparation for Health Canada's approval and, uh, and then increasing access, you know, through programs like the Davy, you know, street program and that sort of thing, so. Thank you. Hopefully that uh, just babbled. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I have another question. Sure. Um, it, it's actually interesting because I think it ties together Renita's presentation with yours that it made me trigger uh, the sort of, so not surprising, but um, finding that uh, people's behavior may be driven more about the f concerns or understanding about HIV risk and much less about their concerns about other sexually transmitted infections risk or in or hepatitis C, for example, and how um, some of these uh, adaptive behaviors that people are engaging in may do well for one but not take into account risks for the other. And how does, how, do you have any sense or have you been looking into this at all about with respect to other uh, risk in terms of acquiring other STDIs? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I, I didn't, um, in, in this data, because it was 2014-15, I didn't specifically look at that. I feel like the surveillance data, I'd rather, you know, wait to do the analysis with the 18-19 data. And so that's one of the things that I will look at is, is you know, STBBI, particularly in relation to things like PrEP. I think that's an important dynamic here. Um, so with these analyses, um, I didn't look at that sort of thing. And also just thinking about like strength-based approaches, I, I and mean, me as a person, I'd rather talk and say, hey, we're doing prep really well than saying like, oh, but you know, all the STIs are happening too. So a, a bit of maybe positive bias on my part. So um, yeah, so I think it's important that we do account for, you know, the ways these things are affecting not just the HIV epidemic, but also things like substance use. And I think that's really a lot of my interest is saying, look at this connection here between the way people use drugs and then, you know, how that affects something like adherence to antiretroviral therapy. And I think, you know, we know from syndemics theories that, right, syndemics of HIV and STBBIs are so common that I think it's part of the equation you can't leave out. But like was presented, I think, at least in the popular psyche, I think it is often not quite as prioritized. And so, uh, I think, I think the community has like, tried to do a lot of work around that and thinking around, you know, I think about BC's like hottest at this, you know, uh, or no, that's not what it was. Uh, oh, I can't remember it now, but they were like syphilis campaigning and that sort of thing to try to, you know, get at that issue I think is important. Yeah, I wasn't so much thinking about the, the risks of STVIs on the negative side, but given the fact that there seems to be a desire to take up Behave, you know, change or adapt to reduce risk. If the, if there could be interventions that would be um, community perhaps proposed that that would be um, agree, you know, be enter into the whole um, what did you call it the kind of homegrown yeah. uh, kind of yeah. risk management strategy. And because it seems like people who are at high risk perceive their risk to be high and are taking measures to reduce that risk. And so if they had if there were more educational or uh, activities or interventions around some of these other infections that, that could be kind of tied into the prep prep uh, uh, package. Oh yeah, so that I agree with 100%. Like, uh, yeah, I think that is that is vital to the challenge for you know moving forward is looking at uh, what community strategies are going to be the most socially acceptable and that sort of thing, and and what is really going to work with, for community, and uh, and I think that we see that that stuff works really well. So thanks for bringing that up. Thanks. I actually chose the Prosecco. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm Sharon Walmsley. I'm the other uh, co-director of the CTN, and I would like to uh, share my congratulations to all of uh, you uh, award winnies, both, both you that uh, are new CTN fellows as well as those who have a renewal. Uh, in my uh, interactions with other networks around the world, all of our colleagues are very jealous of your opportunity, and this really does not exist in, in many other settings. And I think, as Jackie said, we had 20 applicants for these positions. So to pharma out there, look at how great our people are being and being engaged in the network. Open up your 
per springs and let us have twice as many fellows next year. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to move on, and we seem to be on a theme tonight. We're all going to party. Uh, so our next uh, presenter is Dr. Hudson Redden. He is the CTN Merck Postdoctoral Fellow coming to us from the BC Center on Substance Use in the University of British Columbia. He's going to talk to us this evening on the impact of evolving cannabis access and the use on HIV acquisition, transmission, and treatment outcomes. Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Hudson Redden, and I'm going to provide an update on my postdoctoral work looking at the impact of cannabis on HIV transmission, acquisition, and treatment outcomes. Uh, I have no conflicts to declare. Um, so to give a brief background on the topic, um, cannabis is the most widely produced, trafficked, and consumed illicit drug worldwide. Um, and most traditional research is focused on the harms of cannabis use. These include things like dependence, respiratory diseases, or the impacts on different mental health outcomes. Uh, however, the expansion of medical and recreational cannabis policies has continued throughout Canada and the United States, um, and many experts have argued that cannabis hasn't undergone the same rigorous scientific evaluation as other scientific substances, or sorry, psychoactive substances um, that have become regulated. So this has led to concerns um, for vulnerable populations, including youth, uh, people of low socioeconomic status, people suffering with mental illness. Um, as well as different gateway effects or the assumption that cannabis will facilitate the transition to uh, high-risk forms of substance use. Oops. Okay. Um, however, there's an emerging body of evidence showing some beneficial effects of cannabis, particularly for people who use drugs. Um, this includes things like decreasing cocaine and opioid-related cravings, uh, decreasing the risk of overdose, um, as well as different substitution effects. Um, and in the states, medical and recreational cannabis laws have been associated with state-level decreases in opioid-related mortality. Um, and among people who use illicit drugs, um, cannabis has been used intentionally and successfully to decrease the use of certain substances, such as crack cocaine. Um, it's been associated with decreases in fentanyl exposure and increased retention in uh, certain treatments, such as opioid agonist therapies, um, like Suboxone and Methadone. Um, however, there are some limitations of this evidence. Um, it's been mostly cross-sectional or ecological, and they haven't <clears throat> people haven't analyzed individual level data on HIV risk um, or injection drug use patterns. So that brought me to my topic, where I, uh, I'm hoping to evaluate the impact of cannabis access and use um, on HIV acquisition and transmission among people who use drugs. And these include four specific objectives the first of which is to look at the impact on early drug use careers, so injection initiation, um, cessation, as well as relapse, um, characterize the impact of cannabis on HIV, or sorry, HIV infectious disease and overdose risks, um, continue to evaluate substitution effects with drugs such as opioids and crystal methamphetamine, um, and to expand the evidence on uh, engagement in treatment such as opioid agonist therapies and antiretroviral therapy. So to accomplish this, we're using three prospective cohorts of people who uh, use drugs in the downtown east side of Vancouver, Canada, which was discussed in earlier presentations today. Uh, these include the at ARISE study, which involves at-risk youth, the VIDAS study, which includes injection drug users who are HIV negative, and ACCESS, uh, which is HIV positive persons who also use drugs. Now, conveniently, all three of these studies use harmonized recruitment and data collection procedures, so it can pool the analysis of these studies very easily. Um, and these cohorts span the injection drug use career, so at-risk youth, more established injection drug users, and older drug users who are more engaged with addiction and treatment services. Uh, in total, there are over 3,700 people in these studies. Uh, there's a very high prevalence of cannabis use, among 40%. 30% um, are homeless, and up to 50% have some lifetime history of mental health diagnosis. Uh, these participants have been followed up since 2005, and they complete follow-up visits semi-annually where they provide interview-administered questionnaires on drug use and demographic information, um, as well as blood samples for serological analysis. Uh, so the first study that we conducted, we looked at uh, the impact of daily cannabis use on injection initiation, and we used the ARISE study, including 481 injection-naive participants, 
Uh, they were followed up for a 10-year study period, and we looked at cannabis use as well as demographics and other drug use behaviors. And what we found was that 103 initiated injection drug use over follow-up, and that daily cannabis use was associated with lower rates of injection drug use initiation. And other predictors included crack and crystal methamphetamine use, which was consistent with previous research. Uh, we also observed an interaction effect, whereby cannabis decreased the, use, or decreased the likelihood of injection stimulant in initiation, but was not associated with injection opioid initiation. Uh, and there is some existing evidence to support these findings. Uh, cannabis users may be a distinct group of, uh, of drug users who are averse to the, uh, the risks and the dependence uh, associated with injection drug use, and this is supported by qualitative evidence. Uh, both THC and CBD, the two main uh, cannabinoids in cannabis, um, have been shown to decrease cocaine-related cravings in animal models. Um, and as I mentioned previously, cannabis has been used intentionally to decrease crack cocaine use among uh, illicit drug users. Um, as for the gateway effects, these appear to be moderated by things like prevalence and the stigma associated with drugs. So in the Netherlands, for example, where cannabis use is more common and less stigmatized, it has uh, far a less significant gateway effect than in countries such as the United States. Um, and there's also evidence that there's common genetic risk factors for disinhibited behaviors, such as drug use. Um, so the progression from cannabis to other forms of high-risk drug use may be a progression of convenience uh, based on stigma and the availability of certain drugs rather than fundamental properties of cannabis itself. Uh, the second study we looked at, we looked at the impact of cannabis use on the frequency of injection drug use. And for this, we used all three of the studies I described. We included over 2,600 participants. Um, and these participants followed up for 12 years with an average of five follow-up visits per participant. And what we found here was that cannabis was associated with decreased frequency of injection drug use, so another positive finding. Um, and we observed another subgroup effect, although this time cannabis was associated with decreased frequency of opioid use, um, and it was not significantly associated with uh, the frequency of, in, of stimulant injection. And the third study that we're currently, currently doing, we're looking at uh, cannabis use on injection cessation and injection relapse. Um, again, we used all three studies, around 2,300 participants, and we defined injection cessation as a period of at least six months with no injection drug use. And we found that cannabis use was associated, similar to the injection frequency study, um, it was associated with increased injection cessation, so another positive finding. Um, and the subgroup analysis was consistent as well. So cannabis was associated with increased cessation of opiates, but not significantly associated with the cessation of stimulant injecting. Um, as for relapse, we did not observe a significant association with cannabis use. Um, so to explain these findings, uh, cannabis has been shown to normalize opioid system dysfunction and reduce the severity um, of opioid cravings and opioid withdrawal. Uh, and both endocannabinoid and opioid receptors are expressed in similar neuronal pathways in the brain. Uh, they produce similar intracellular signaling cascades, and cannabis has been shown to moderate the reward associated with certain drugs, such as opioids. Um, and CBD, which might have the most potential to uh, address substance use disorder, um, has been associated with decreased stress responses in the amygdala, and, uh, dec which decreases the drug-related cues that promote drug-seeking behavior. And as I mentioned before, the population level data that has shown uh, state level decreases in opioid related mortality linked to medical and recreational uh, cannabis policies. And finally, states with uh, medical cannabis laws have experienced decreases in Medicare prescriptions for things like pain, depression, and anxiety, which are commonly reported reasons for substance use among people who use illicit drugs. Uh, so, to conclude, cannabis has shown preliminary evidence here to reduce drug-related harm among people who use illicit drugs, um, and these effects appear to vary based on the type of substances used, um, and there appear to be some very unique effects of THC versus CBD, so expanding this evidence will provide more detail on the potential to use cannabis to reduce drug-related harm in this population. And lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge the support of the CTN, um, as well as the BCCSU staff and uh, participants where I work, um, and my supervisors, Dr. M.J. Malloy and Dr. Evan Wood. Thank you. I either missed it or I don't know. I don't, I'm always looking for gender analysis. Were these all men or did you have some women in your study? 
Uh, it's fairly balanced. It's about 57% uh, men in the studies. And, and did you do a, a, a sex-specific analysis to see if there was any differences? Uh, we haven't for this, but um, we, we realize that that's important with the evidence out there. So the current studies that we're doing, we have included that. And we have found some significant differences that, for men and women. Yeah. Any other questions? I just wondered, uh, was this naturalistic use of cannabis and the other drugs, or was it like a prescription and they were trying it out to try to reduce their use? Could you talk a little about yeah. the three studies and the use? Yeah, so it's all, um, it's all naturalistic. These are um, prospective cohort studies where we're just following and collecting data from, um, I guess, people involved in the illicit drug market. Um, it's all non-legal cannabis use. Yeah. Thank you. It will be important to continue your work in the era of, of legal use to see if uh, some of your hypotheses may change. Uh, so our last uh, speaker of the evening uh, is Dr. Priscilla Medeiros. She is the CTN Gilead postdoctoral fellow uh, working at a women's college hospital in Toronto. Uh, her topic is entitled Geospatial Analysis of Barriers to Care Among Women Living with HIV in Canada. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today to be able to talk about my exciting work um, amongst women living with HIV in Canada. Um, my project does draw on data from the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, also known as CHIWAUS, to study the experiences of health and access to care among women living with HIV in Ontario specifically at this point. I would like to start my presentation by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Um, there is no conflict of interest to declare. So women living with HIV experience many barriers to care which are heavily shaped by gender and intersect to increase women's vulnerability to HIV and other STBBIs. Now in response to this literature, I should say growing literature, my project builds on Chiwaus's methods and practices to first examine the direct relationship between perceived barriers to care and quality of life for women living with HIV in Ontario, second to expand its national reach um, of the body mapping study to the Atlantic provinces where little attention has really been paid to their social and uh, and health needs. And lastly, to develop a toolkit focused on the strategies for improving health outcomes for women living with HIV in Canada. So the Barriers to Care model, um, also known as BACS, was developed in 1998 to determine whether experiences of people living with HIV was different. Uh, women living with HIV enrolled in Chihuahua's completed this BACS questionnaire through which they reported the extent to which they found each of the 12 potential barriers uh, to access uh, difficult or problematic. The figure one that I've provided on the slide um, shows the four subscales of BACs and listed underneath the 12 item scales used to measure access to care and services or opportunities women wish to obtain in their own communities. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with geospatial analysis, or uh, GIS in this case, um, its use is to design, manage, analyze, and display health, social, and environmental data sets. So this method plays an important role in my own work in describing and understanding the changing social organization of healthcare, uh, for examining the relationships to health outcomes and access, and for exploring how healthcare delivery can ultimately be improved. Uh, Women's College Hospital maintains a very strong relationship with U of T, and through my postdoctoral fellowship, I will continue to advance my training in GIS through their maps and data library, as well as through the Esri Canada instructor-led online courses. 
So phase one of the study involves the application of spatial technology to the barriers to care that Chivo's data has developed and collected, but specifically for the province of Ontario. Um, it is the first use of this explanatory tool in Chiwaus to study women's experiences living with HIV. Now an attempt is being made to include all of the Chiwaus participants in this study, as I had mentioned, starting with the province of Ontario. And this is in a way to further contribute to the understanding of the current state of care and well-being of women living with HIV in Canada. So in order to be included in the analysis, uh, participants must meet the following eligibility criteria. They must have provided the first three characters of their postal code or location of residence, which is referenced as forward sortation areas. Second, women living with HIV in Ontario must have responded to at least 50% or more of the barriers to care questionnaire, which would have been six out of 12 questions. Um, and the reason for this um, is to create reliable and reflective visualizations that adequately show women's reported extent of barriers to care severity within the postal districts themselves. So objective one of the study was to carry out a snapshot of women living with HIV in Ontario, and uh, that's from sociodemographic, geographic, reproductive, and clinical variables. Um, there is no hypothesis for this objective, however, it was being used to not only familiarize um, myself with the data, but to understand disease spread and interaction amongst women living with HIV in Ontario, especially considering my work focuses specifically in the past on the maritime provinces. So table one on the PowerPoint slide is actually an example of what the snapshot itself will look like once it's finished. Uh, some of the variables and code lines for this objective are already completed and that was using SAS software. So I'll be adding some new lines to the code throughout this summer to ensure that all of the variables are accounted for in the snapshot. Now, uh, one of the team members in the project is also assisting me in this endeavor. So objective two is looking to visualize the medical health care and community support services that are available in Ontario for women living with HIV. Um, I'm in the process of actually geocoding this information. Um, I have also studied this topic in the past using qualitative GIS approaches, um, but specifically in the maritime provinces during my PhD work, and would be very happy to speaking uh, more directly about this during perhaps poster sessions tomorrow. So objective three is really looking to assess the associations among sociodemographic variables and backs among women living with HIV in Ontario. Um, up until this point, the emphasis of my work and analysis has actually been on objective four, um, which is to visualize the geographic distribution of barriers to care among women living with HIV in Ontario. And uh, this was done by spatially weighting women's 12-point questionnaire responses about barriers to care and determining its intensity in the province. So it was thought that barriers to care among women living with HIV uh, would be more severe in rural communities than in urban centers. Um, but what we found surprisingly in the preliminary results when creating these visualizations of the wave one and wave two data was that this was in fact not what we were, uh, what happened. So at a glance at the two images of the Ontario map, uh, you can see the changes over time reported in severity of perceived barriers to care among women living with HIV. So for example, the more northern forward sortation area in wave one, highlighted in uh, darker orange, it should be showing up, indicated a higher problem severity rating to uh, reported barriers to care. However, follow-up visits when women uh, were recontacted 18 months later um, about access to care and of course its overall implications on their health show that the same forward sortation area in wave two shows no reported uh, severity in any capacity. So this observation and many others in the visualizations require further analysis of the Chiwos data and uh, is the next step in actually answering a lot of the larger questions that we have around barriers to care. To care. So zooming into the Ontario map frame for wave one and wave two um, in the geographical regions, of Toronto, Hamilton, and uh, the Niagara Falls, we can also see an increasing extent of change in the severity of barriers to care in some uh, more urban centers. So some of the explanations to consider in answering as to why these changes of severity are occurring uh, include migration within the provinces and areas where women living with HIV are not receiving care at all, 
uh, loss to follow up in Ontario at the 18 month follow up mark when women living with HIV were actively participating in phase one, participant death, as well as participant withdrawal from the study. So these are all really uh, starting points for us to further investigate alongside the concurrent analysis of objectives one to three um, to add more context around the visualizations that we're creating. So table two uh, provides an overview understanding of the severity rates among women living with HIV in Ontario. Now based on the responses of women living with HIV, the five barriers to care with the higher problem severity ratings were absence of psychological support, inadequate or affordable housing, personal financial resources or financial instability, lack of job opportunities, and an unsatisfactory working environment. So there are additional uh, research objectives associated with phase one of this study that um, I won't expand on in the, time, uh, in the sake of time, but would be happy to discuss later on as well. Uh, what I do want to let you know is that Mona and I have been talking extensively uh, about the plans of further visualizing analysis around Chiwo's data, specifically barriers to care and the secondary assessment of quality of life. So the question that we're really looking to answer um, around this information surrounds how barriers to healthcare access affect health-related quality of life among women living with HIV in Ontario. So the second phase of this study will also expand Chiwaus's body mapping study to the Atlantic provinces, and this is in order to uh, validate the current women-centered care model uh, and scale. So Mona and I have been discussing the research protocol for this part um, of the study more recently, um, including site locations, the hiring and training of uh, research associates, the number of body mapping workshops itself, and budget items. So I received training to facilitate body mapping with members from the Chiwaus team in June of last year. And the photograph on the slide was the uh, body map I actually created during the three-day facilitator's guide training workshop in Ontario. Now we're in the early stages of applying for planning grants to re-engage with community members as well as various organizations in Atlantic Canada um, in order to coordinate um, an aligned timeline as to when to hold these body mapping workshops. So the following PowerPoint slide speaks to the uh, first year CTN timeline of my work, which focuses on continuing the geospatial analysis of barriers to care, as well as the inclusion of quality of life, and starting phase two of the body mapping workshop um, in the province of New Brunswick to begin with. So the results of this project really serve to inform the need of a women-centered care model it has the potential to impact how we care for and approach HIV among women living with HIV across Canada, especially um, in, in light of findings that we will come about in part two of this study. Applying for geospatial um, analysis of Chiwaus's barriers to care and quality of life also provides us with the capability to identify high priority areas in Ontario that require further study and analysis. In terms of future directions for this work, um, I would like to add geospatial analysis for wave three data, which has recently become available in Ontario. This data recently um, will add some additional value on the longitudinal aspect of analyzing correlations uh, in, in terms of BACs, and to complete BACs analysis for British Columbia and Quebec as well. So I'd like to thank all of the women living with HIV who participated in Chiwaus, my sponsors of course, my supervisor, Donna Mona, uh, Dr. Mona Lufti, who couldn't be here today for her ongoing guidance and support and training, as well as all of the team members involved in this current project. Thank you. Thank you. Quite an ambitious uh, piece of work. <laughs> um, I, I'm recognizing that the time is late uh, and the annual general meeting has started, but we'll try and have uh, one or two questions. I guess my first question is, is how do you envision using the data that you acquire through your mapping to make change? Absolutely, so that relates a lot to my third objective, which is to create this toolkit, which showcases some strategies as to how we can go about improving health outcomes for women and, and using those 
specific um, visualizations around barriers to care and its correlation to quality of life to showcase the challenges, uh, the areas specifically that require further intervention, and perhaps suggestions as to how we can go through it based on the additional available CHIWAS data. If there are no other questions, I would like to thank you and all of our presenters today for doing such a fantastic job. Uh, and we look forward to the continued cascade of care and the Marina Klein challenge to become the co-director as you continue your path with the CTN. Thank you everyone for your attention and for uh, participating this evening.